Amazing things can happen when you go alcohol free. My name is James Swanick. Welcome to the show. Today we're talking to a gentleman by the name of Justin McClure, who's based in Atlanta, Georgia, who is a very successful businessman and has been 11 years alcohol free now. And just before we hit record here, we were talking a little bit about his journey from comedian and uh, sort of hustler, go, 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 to becoming alcohol free 11 years now, and then going on to create uh, amazing business ventures in part with uh, a gentleman that you might know of called Damon John, who's one of the Shark Tank uh, personalities. Shark Tank, of course, is the very famous television series that celebrates all things entrepreneurship. And uh, our guest today, Justin McClure, is also the author of a book called uh, Daily Sober. So, Justin, great to have you with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. I think you kind of summed it up there. A lot of that can be summed up with that if you get your life together and you're patient, better things will happen in sobriety. And I think a lot of my story is that is that I just uh, was patient, meaning that when I got sober, I knew great things would happen the next day. But if I just stayed the course, I might be surprised at some of the things that happened. And through that, you know, you meet people like Damon John and other people and you build businesses. Um, but it, but it all happened from one day when I decided, you know, I think the problem in my life is me and I need to address that. And until I do that, my life is uh, going to continue to be a downward spiral, which it was. Um, I was a comedian for years, but now as a sober person, I, you know, there's something deep to this to say that I was able to, to stop stand up comedy in a second after I got sober and I got healthy because I realized. I didn't love stand-up comedy. I loved that people laughed at me. I, 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 needed, I needed to feel accepted. I needed to feel like I was worthy, like I was good-looking. I was funny. I was charismatic. Once people decided I was those things, I felt better about myself. Um, the sober journey, obviously, we can talk about, taught me that once I got healthy with myself and I learned to love myself, I realized I didn't need people telling me that I was anything. Yeah. Yeah, I get that. It's funny because when I, I'm from Australia and my native uh, country is Australia. And when I moved over to California in the early 2000s, they really expected me to be the larrikin Australian crocodile Dundee character who was a big drinking mm -hmm. kind of fun loving larrikin. And so I played into that role and they loved it. They lapped it up. The Americans absolutely celebrated me for it. So you know, I, I played rugby for Los Angeles Rugby Club and at the end of, the, uh, of a match on a, or a game on a Saturday, we'd go back to this very famous bar in Manhattan Beach called Sharky's. Manhattan Beach is a little bit south of uh, Los Angeles Airport. I've been there. I live in California. I've been there. Yeah. I live in Santa Monica, so I've been there. I, 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 know, I know Sharky's. I got drunk there before. <laughs> <laughs> if I was lucky enough or unlucky in hindsight to win the Man of the Match award, I would have to chug beer out of a rugby boot uh while everyone was around me going chug 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 and you know i got introduced as the aussie guy oh he's a big drinker he's a great guy you know and so i just played into that personality and it was only years later after i'd stopped drinking alcohol that i realized that i was really getting a lot of my self-worth or uh validation from playing that character and it sounds like what you're sharing is you got a lot of yeah. that as well from your career as a comedian yeah, yeah. And, and, let, and let me just tell you about the day that I got sober. The day I, I'm 11 years sober. I remember the day I got sober. I was womanizing in New York City. I was dating everybody because I felt so bad about myself. I, ne I need a woman to make me feel good. So there was one day that I said, you know what? I've been chasing this, this woman forever. If I can just go out with her, will I be happy? If she'll just give me the time, will I be happy? And she said, okay, we're going to go out. We'll go out tonight. We went out that night and we had a great time. And she liked me a lot. She liked, so so the, the person I wanted, she liked me. And then I remember walking home and I felt miserable. And I thought to myself, Justin, why is it time and time again, you want something and you seem to get it and then you're just miserable right after. And then, you know, I went home and I started drinking wine and I turned on this uh, show called uh, 30 for 30. It's a, it's a basketball movie about Chris Heron. And he wasted his MBA career through drugs and alcohol. And as I was miserable watching that, I saw this guy waste his life, his career, MBA career. And then there was a moment in the movie where he got sober and he became a hero in his community. 
And and I was like, wow, that's amazing. Like, look how great he looks now. But he went back to a 7-Eleven and he said, right here is where I passed out while my wife and my kid were at the airport waiting for me. And I remember looking at the TV and I said, that's pathetic. And then I said, oh, wait, that's you. You know, Justin, that that's you. Because a week before that, I missed the airplane because uh, I was drunk. So all of this culmination of the of people making me feel good and me trying to make myself feel better and validation, it kind of culminated in me trying to get this woman who liked me and then realizing that I was miserable right after it. And that was my that was my road to like really looking at myself. What uh, fortuitous timing, I guess, that you watched that basketball documentary 30 for 30 as well, right? I mean, what happens if what would have happened if you had not watched that documentary on that night do you think would something else have happened do you think that you would have chosen sobriety would it have just been delayed you know what i don't think i've ever been asked that james that is a great question i'm going to think about it truthfully now because up until that point you know uh why would i continue doing something that i i had three duis driving under the influences i've been incarcerated six times drunk in public fighting in public i mean I had all I had all kind of I'd been in rehab twice, but there was something about that night when I saw Chris Heron and I and because I was an athlete, you know, I, I had a couple of scholarships. I played basketball. So I saw my I saw something in him. And, and when he got sober, it, it inspired me. So I guess, James, the, 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 the answer is that I don't know, because the moment he the moment I said to the TV, that's pathetic what he did. Then I said, oh, wait, that's you. I had so much shame go through my body. But then right after that, I had inspiration and hope because I said, you don't have to make this choice anymore. Like you can make a different choice. So I said right there, I was, I was drunk and it was late at night and I was watching this thing. And I said, you know what? Tomorrow, tomorrow, I'm not going to drink. I don't care. If I punch a horse in the face, I don't care if I get in a fight. I don't care what I do, but I'm not drinking. I'm not going to drink tomorrow. And, um, you know, James, I haven't drank since because that one day led into another day. And then I said, well, let me go to AA meetings and let me get a sponsor. 90 and 90. Okay, let's do that. Let's find some new friends, people, places, things. But then really what, what I had to deal with after about nine months of sobriety, I started to feel really guilty about you know, Justin, why did you do all this to yourself? Like, what? why did you not see you're a smart person? Why did you not see what you've been doing to yourself for you? Why didn't you quit a long time ago? And then I started to realize in therapy, I went every Wednesday and I started to realize through childhood trauma and other things, you know, my mother had me at 16. My father died when I was four. So my mother was a widow at 20 with two kids. So we were very poor. There was neglect. There are all these different things. So I realized through therapy, it had to come out somewhere. It had to come out somewhere, all the neglect and all these different things. And for me, it came out in alcohol and wanting to be accepted um, and validated. Once I, could, once I could understand that about myself, I was able to forgive myself and love myself a little bit. And when I started to love myself a little bit, I started to love myself a little bit more. And when I started to love myself, I realized I didn't need other people validating me and that was the road to recovery not just getting sober but getting sober in my head yeah yeah i can relate to that on so many levels i, re I remember getting validation from women similar to your story it seems like if, if all of my self-worth came from does the opposite sex find me attractive and through therapy i traced that back to what i yeah. observed in my parents and things like that uh and I remember my the day that I stopped drinking, which was uh, March 2010. I was in Austin, Texas at that year's annual South by Southwest Festival. And I went out to an industry party. I had two Bombay Sapphire gin and tonics, woke up the next morning in a hotel 20 minutes outside of Austin. And I looked in the mirror and I just went, enough. You know, like I, I looked weathered and tired. I was yeah. overweight. And I went to an IHOP in an International House of Pancakes next door to this hotel. And I sat there and then I thought, what am I doing in an IHOP? And that was the moment that I said, I'm just going to stop for 30 days. Now, my intent was just 30 days. I never imagined that mm. I would go 14 and a half years as what I am now as we're recording this today. 
But that was my moment. And it was really driven from a feeling of mediocrity. Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't actually mm. submit that I was rock bottom. I didn't get DUIs yeah. like it sounds like you did. I didn't wake up in a ditch. I didn't have a like yeah. a big, dramatic, shocking rock bottom moment. Mine was kind of like death by a thousand cuts. It was like 20 years of mediocrity that it all kind of yeah. built up into one one situation. That was my trigger mm. to make a change. And, you know, I felt so good after 30 days. I just kept going and going and going. And here we are 14 years later. Well, it's, well, so, well the same thing, James. You know, I, I got DUIs. Uh, well before this, but you know what? I, you might relate to the same thing. I told myself, you're not an alcoholic. You're just a wild and crazy guy, Justin. You're just crazy. Like you're just more fun than everybody. And the people who are more fun in life, more things happen to them. Like you're just, you're the guy people tell stories about. But when, when I watched that movie, the Chris Heron story, the same thing you just said, I, I felt so mediocre for the first time in my life. I was not able to excuse who I really was. I was a guy who had a six-figure salary, yet I couldn't afford my own place. I was sleeping on somebody's couch. I was dating four women a week and wasting all my money trying to get validation. Uh, I didn't have any real friends. So in that moment of looking at Chris Heron, it wasn't that like I wanted to get, I wanted to stop drinking as much as I really looked at myself in the mirror and I saw myself for who I really was, which is a very mediocre person who was not achieving anything in life. I knew I had a lot of potential, but I was, it was not manifesting at all because of the lifestyle I was living. So the DUIs for me were like five years before. I just told myself, I'm just wild and crazy. Um, but in that moment, when I looked in the mirror, I said, no, this is who you really are. You, you are somebody who is not achieving what you could do in life because other things are holding you back. And that's when I said, well, tomorrow, I don't care what I do, but I'm not drinking. And once again, like you said, I mean, it's led to uh, to uh, 11 years. And um, if you were to tell me then that I'd be here now, not that I wouldn't believe it, I would believe it because I would say, you know what, Justin, if you take all this energy that, that you put into running the streets and womanizing and drinking and you put it over here, you probably could do amazing things. You probably could build great businesses. You probably could have a happy family. And that's what's happened is I just, I kind of took my energy from here and I put it over here. It's kind of like the analogy. If you take a plane and it's going this way and it's going one and you change it one degree, it's going to end up in a whole different city. Yes. So it's kind of the same thing. It's kind of the same thing with my life. It's kind of like once I started getting healthier, I kind of got addicted to the new life more than the old life. And I think that's my biggest thing is that daily sober, it's one lesson at a time. It's one, it's one page a day is all it is. But the whole thing is if you can make your life bigger in sobriety than it was in your addiction, you'll never go back to that. But I, every time I relapse it's because I, I, I wasn't creating a better life in sobriety. I was romanticizing about the drunken days. and I'd go back to that. But the moment I started creating a bigger life and it became big, just in little alcohol, then I never went back to alcohol or drugs. Yeah. A lot of our prospective members uh, tell us on phone calls when they're considering engaging our stop drinking services. And for context, we have a 90-day a, a stop drinking process where we help our members rewire their mindset. And then, you know, we've got some other uh, communities that go on for well past a year. Um, they fear that they will be dull and boring if or when they stop drinking alcohol. And they cannot understand the association between being alcohol free and having fun and having a more pleasurable life. And then I've looked at this, I've spoken to professors at universities and addiction experts around the brain circuitry as to what happens. And I've come to learn that, you know, when we drink alcohol, it fires off our dopamine receptors. And then when we stop drinking alcohol, because the dopamine receptors have been overused, it's very, it, it can feel challenging to try to to get back to that kind of high or any type of enjoyment from any activity that does not involve alcohol. And, mm -hmm. and then over time, as the dopamine receptors repair and it, it, we start to get similar levels of, uh, let's, let's call it fulfillment in life or new levels of fulfillment. And those steady levels over many months and years 
now become so much more pleasurable than any temporary uh, dopamine hits that we would get from drinking alcohol. Mm. Is that your understanding of yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. You, like you know what? I, I, I love that. I love that. I'm going to – so the other night I told my wife, I, I'm like, you know what I really like? How boring my life is. Meaning that I don't have to hide my phone. I don't have to hide any part of my life. I don't have to – because because a lot of addiction is is like – looking over your shoulder or like hiding your phone or like you, you all this mischievous things that you think are exciting. Like my life is, my life is, is wild. I told my life, I told, when I tell people it, that are trying to get sober and they talk about being bored, that, that is an asset. If your life is boring, that means you got no stress. That means, that means you got no problems. So I want a boring life now. My boring life is like, I go outside and I look at my lawn and I play with my kids and you know, like I said, my wife can pick up my phone. I'm not worried about what she finds, like all these different things. I really, really embrace a boring life. And maybe that's because over the years, the dopamine has rewired to say, OK, let there's there's he's finding more pleasure in long term things like family and love and emotional connection versus the very ephemeral. You know, I got to get a fix right now. I got to get a hit right now or I got to try to hook up right now. Yeah. So what's wrong with being boring? Nothing. Yeah. Well, I think we got to define the word boring because I just, I, as you were saying that, I typed into Google, what's the definition of boring? And it says not interesting and tedious. So I would actually submit that boring is not the most effective word, although we can use the word boring with a slight grin on our face, like to, yeah. to, to demonstrate the meaning of what we're saying. Because it's non-dramatic. It, it, just, for, for, for me, it was just like lack of drama. So I have a yeah. lack of drama. I have no drama in my life. And sometimes I tell my wife, I'm like, you know what? I have no drama in my life. And that's such an amazing thing. But I, I remember back in my life when I would have, I'd be texting five or six girls at one time and I'd be lying about this thing. And I'd be trying to, I would change this date to do that instead. And I would try to like do this thing. And that, that drama I felt was exciting. And now yeah. obviously I have none of that. Yes. Well, the reason people find that exciting is because it literally fires off dopamine receptors in the brain, like, and people become addicted to it to the to the point where they feel dead if they don't have drama. Also, it fires off cortisol and a lot of other bad hormones, and these things kill you just as much as a bad diet does. So, when you have a bunch of cortisol and stress and norepinephrine in your blood, it's not good as well. But we think that's exciting and we think that's pleasurable, but really, it's just chaotic and wild. I mean, when I was drinking and driving, I got three DUIs. I mean, I, I'm so grateful now I didn't hurt myself or somebody else. But at the time, I'm like, man, I'm driving drunk. Dude, yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. It's ridiculous. Yeah. I must admit, years later now, I used to leave the Jones Bar on Santa Monica Boulevard in, in Hollywood, and I would drive my 1990 Chevy Corsica car from the bar back home around midnight, 1230. And I, after having only like a few drinks, and I used to think I'm fine with a few drinks, and but then but maybe it was actually four. And in when I grew up in Australia, the legal driving drinking limit for driving was 0.05, but in California it was 0.08. Mm -hmm. And because I had 0.08, which is all, you know, towards double of what it is in Australia, I thought, oh, I can have another drink. I'll tell you, I was, I, I'm sure I went through a couple of red lights or I remember going through a couple of red lights because I didn't want to wait yeah. because I'd had a few drinks in me. And I feel terrible about that now. Yeah. Thankfully, nothing happened. I remember pulling into the Carl's Jr. Burger drive through at 1230 on the corner of Santa Monica Boulevard and, and La Cienega or, or La Brea, I think it was, and getting burgers and trying to eat the burger and fries yeah. while I'm driving home with one wheel, one hand on the steering wheel, trying to get back to my place on the corner of DeLong, Prey and Highland. I had to be over 0.08. I had to be. Yeah. I'm so fortunate nothing terrible happened. Well, the reason you didn't get arrested is because I got all my DUIs in California. They pulled me over first. Right. Right. <laughs> but, yeah. you know, it's, it's kind of like at the time, even when I got the DUIs and I had to do two months in jail on the third one, like I, it, it got to a point of like, even then I didn't stop. I, I stopped. I got out. I stopped for like a month. But then I did not fix my brain. My brain was not fixed. So I went right back to it. And the whole point of when I moved to New York, when I got sober, this was deep because for the first time in my life, when I saw that video and that movie 
and I looked in the mirror, I saw who I really was. And I really, my ego diminished in one moment, my ego just diminished. And I, I was like, Justin, this is who you really are. Now, I'm also really big on uh, like Eastern, Eastern philosophy, Alan Watts, Taoism, all this kind of stuff. So I also, in that moment, I said, you know what, Justin, you might live to be 88, 92, whatever it is. You have a choice to be happy. And I decided, I said, you know what, I don't think for me to be happy, if I want to make that choice, that alcohol and drugs can fit into that. So I need to consider if I'm going to live to be that long and I want to be happy, how can I set the rest of my life up for that? And I said, I don't think that you can you can do this anymore. So part of it was like looking forward in my life to know that I might I'll have many years ahead. And how can I leave behind what I've done and forgive that and have a new, better life where I'm happier and healthier? You referenced a couple of times that you did prison time. What were you doing prison time for? Was it the DUIs? Third DUI. Yeah, I, I, they were all in one year. James, I got three DUIs in one year. And so what, what's the sentencing for each one? Or does it only kick in after you've got two or three in a row? Well, you know what? I got two within two weeks. So, and, and that's enough for you to be sentenced then and to get prison Okay, time? So, so when you get one DUI, you go to jail. I mean, you go to the court about 30 days later. But I had two DUIs by the time I went to court. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. So, so, I, so, I had to, so the point is, and I've talked about this before, there's some privilege in my skin color, and I had I had some money where I could pay for an attorney. And all I had to do, my 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 attorney said he's gonna he's going to rehab, he's gonna straighten it all out. And the judge was like, okay, that's good enough, okay. And I think a lot of that is because of my skin color, and I had money for an attorney. But then when I maybe got you third, should maybe you should just clarify with our listeners your skin color, Justin. Oh, my skin color is white, and and I say that. Uh, you know, not to fast forward, but my wife is Nigerian. I have a I have a blended family, um, but I'm very open about how I believe that I probably got a certain privilege because of my white skin color. I had a little bit of money, whereas I was able to pay the attorney and they were able to help me out. If I was another skin yeah. color, I don't think I would have been I've uh, been in that situation. I really got to be honest with that. So, but the third DUI in the same year, I got another DUI. That's when they kind of throw the book at me. They like this. This dude did not do what he said he's going to do. So I had to do like a month of uh, jail and I had to do like two months of work furlough. Work furlough was when I, I got to work during the day. I was an engineer at the time. I got to work during the day and at night I had to be in jail. So every day I would I would. And, and, and James, you're an athlete like you'll appreciate this. Let me tell you a quick story. I had 30 minutes. This is no joke. I had 30, and I couldn't drive. There was no bus around. They gave me 30 minutes, 6.30 a.m. At 7 a.m., they would be at my job to make sure I was there because I had to be where I said I was going to be. I ran five miles every day for two months. Now, this is a great, this is a great story, okay? 6.30 in the morning to 7 o'clock. They might be at my job at 7.05, 7.15 to make sure I'm there. I'm running in the rain. Now, I will I will backtrack and say that I had a scholarship for, for track and cross country. I was a good runner. So, but running five miles in 30 minutes is a really tough task. Woo, crazy. But I did it. And I did it twice a day. I did it because I had to get home. I had to be back by 7 p.m. So 6.30 to 7, I would run and I would get back. Now, I did two months of that. And you can still look this up in 2002. When I got done with my work furlough, I entered the Big Sur Marathon on the, on the coast of Monterey. You know this. Big Sur. I placed 30th out of, I think, 5,000, a sub three hour marathon. I didn't even practice. When, when wow. I, I didn't even practice because when I was in work furlough, all I did was push ups and run. And so when I got out, I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sign up for this marathon. And I, I finished wow. like top 1%. So drinking so, so James, to James, the top the 1% is, of athletes in the world. <laughs> so, so James, the point here is, is that I was wired in a certain way to be great at everything. And if, you, and if I put alcohol and drugs in front of me, I'm going to be great at it. That's when I decided, I said, you know, Justin, you have the potential. If you just put your energy in better places, you can do great things. And that was kind of the, the early seed of saying, well, wh why don't you figure out something better to do with your life than chasing women around and drinking? 
Last question, just on the uh, the work furlough, and then we want to move into what actually happened. What were the cons or the the benefits and the results that happened in your life from being consistently alcohol free? When you where did you have to stay overnight? Like, was it in a prison or minimum? Like, where yeah, was it at? Jail. I know you, which jail was it? What and what were the conditions there? Just for the listener who's like maybe trying to discourage themselves from getting DUIs. Well, you know, I I can tell you two stories. The, the one story is when I went to jail, jail, when you went to the county jail, you know, that, that was terrible because you, you know, you checked in and they gave you your bed over your shoulder. You literally carried your bed and then you went into a barracks of like 60 people and they were all these tough people. I went in there and I started shadow boxing to try to, I, I really did. I went in there in the corner and started shadow boxing because I thought somebody's going to rape me or something like that. And uh, so th that was that experience. Work furlough. Um, is more for the professional. It is a yeah, jail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is a jail, but you're but you're in the same room with about 25 other people, and they all stink. And you eat the same thing, and uh, you you got to wear you, you got to wear your your orange clothes when you're there. Um, but you wow. get to leave to go. You get to leave to go to work. Um, yeah. Was it yeah. fun? No. Were, were there rules? Yeah. I mean, you had to do what they said, but you could also play ping pong and pool. Um, it was it was not enjoyable. It gave me a lot of motivation to say. You know, I've done good things in my life. I helped a startup. I was successful. But then at that point, I, I looked at, I'm like, no, Justin, you're just a guy in jail. Like, you are a dude in jail right now. That's that's where you are. Yeah. So let's talk about all the great things that happened because uh, I know that you've gone on and your family now are big social media stars. I think you've got 12 million social followers, 2 billion YouTube views. Yeah. Um, maybe before you, maybe before you get to that point, maybe just tell us the story from like year one of being alcohol free to where we are today. What happened? Well, yeah, you, you'll 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 love this, and I think you're, the people listening will love this. So when I was a drunk, I was also a womanizer. But when I got sober after going to starting going to therapy, I said I don't need to date either. I need to take at least a year off of dating anybody. I need to figure out who I am. So living in New York City, I changed all my people, places, things. And I talked about this in a TED Talk, that when I got done with work, I was working in, in Wall Street and I was living in Washington Heights, which is five miles away up Manhattan. And to keep me out of bars and to keep me away from people I didn't need to be around, I walked, once again, physical, something very physical, I walked from Wall Street all the way to Washington Heights, even in the snow, even in the rain, I walked. Why? Because I didn't know if I was strong enough to stay out of bars. If I took the subway home and I got home at 730 and I'm sitting on my couch, I didn't know if I would go to the bar if I had that time. So I took, so I eliminated that. I said, you're going to walk. And what I did, I started listening to podcasts. I started listening to podcasts like yours, self-improvement, other things. And I started, I started to enjoy it. So I said, no dating, no dating, no dating for a year, therapy sobriety, I started to, my, I, my dopamine, and I started to rewire myself. And you know about this, people, you, you can't stop, you can't get sober and not change everything else. And it's not going to take a day. So I said, in one year, let's see what happens. Therapy, no dating. So after about a year and a half of no dating, uh, my wife, I was getting out of the subway and I looked across, I looked across the street and I saw this beautiful woman and she was getting harassed by some guys chasing her because she, she physically she's stunning. And I went over to try to save her. I pretended like I knew her. I walked up to her and I said, hey, these guys behind you are like, they're, hey, baby, hey, baby, why don't you just pretend like you know me? Walk around the corner with me. Like, you know, they'll leave you alone. We walked around the corner. We talked, went to a restaurant, and then she became my wife. Well played, sir. Well played. <laughs> so the story, the, the story there is, is that I did not date, and I said I'm going to figure out who I am. Now the greater story there is, James, is that after I got to know her and she's beautiful, she told me she had, I, she told me she just had twins a year ago. So she was a new mom. She had a bad relationship with a guy who treated her bad. Uh, he cheated on her, left her when she was pregnant. James, I didn't want to be a husband or a dad. It's been a year and a half. I just kind of want to get laid, right? I'm sober, but you know what? I said, th this is the most powerful thing I can tell you. I said, you know what, Justin, 
your way got you where you are. And now you're sober. Why don't you at least be open to thinking you may not know what you want with your life? You, you, you like this woman. Yes. Meet her kids. I met her kids. And within a couple hours, I said, I'm going to be their dad. I said, I'm going to be their dad. And within a year, I was married to her and I adopted her, her daughters, which became my daughters. And we've been happily ever after since. And this was, that was, uh, nine years ago, nine wow. years ago. In those two, uh, hours that you spent with the kids that kind of had you embodying the father role and the husband role and the I'm assuming like maybe the provider or protector role like what was it that happened in those two hours that made you go okay yes empathy empathy I looked at those little girls and I felt they were so beautiful and they were so innocent and I, I remember myself as a young boy being scared and not having anyone and having a dad who passed away and being very scared. I remember being four and five and, and thinking, why am I, why can a little boy be this scared of life? You know? And I remember looking at these girls and, and uh, knowing what they'd already gone through and how great of a person my, my wife was or is um, at the time, my you know, person I was getting to know. And I just looked at them and I said, you know what? I want to give them what I never received. And I think, by my effort in doing that, they will give me way more in return than I ever could possibly imagine. If I just take that chance, because now that I'm sober, if I don't want this, Justin, what, what are you saying? You don't want a family? Are you saying you, you want to go back to running the streets? Well, now's your chance to have something completely different. And I, my heart just opened up and just said, let me, let me give it a shot. Let me give it a shot. Because when I looked at how innocent and beautiful these little girls were, I just said, man, they just deserve a good dad. And I, I think I'm at the place where I, I, I can do that. Beautiful. And what happened then over the next few years and the, and the, you know, the subsequent years? Well, you know, I, I, had, a, I had a past of nine years of stand-up comic. Uh, I, worked with the, I worked with Seinfeld and Dana Carr. I worked with everybody, right? Um, I worked all across the country. So I was a, I was a storyteller. I, I could write jokes. So I, I, I got my camera out and we started making little videos and a couple of videos went viral. Uh, we were on Good Morning America, the Today Show. We did a lot of big stuff and people just started following. They, they just thought my twins were precious and my wife and they loved the family, that we're, we had a good story, we're blended. And people just started following us. And then the next thing you know, we started working with brands like, uh, you know, Disney and, and Google and all these big brands. And it started paying good money. And it just it just kind of took off. So once again, I, I took I took the energy that I had in my addiction and I put it into learning how to edit, learning how to be a filmmaker, learning digital marketing, learning social media, learning graphic design. I taught myself everything. And so that's the other thing is once again, I took my energy from one place, I put it over here and I was able to, to accumulate some great skills that were very valuable in building this business. And then, you know, a couple of years ago, I meet a guy like Damon John and now he's my business partner. So it's, it's kind of like been this culmination of a lot of great things have happened and I've earned it all. And that's not arrogant. That's humble. I've earned it all. Yeah. Yeah, that's incredible. And I know a lot of uh, people who refer to themselves as an alcoholic or an addict will say that they have no control. Uh, what's your view on that? Because my, my view is that we all have control, even if we feel out of control, and that the language, that language that we use to describe what's going on with us is so, so critically important. So coming back to the, the, the question, what's your view on those who say that they have no control? No, what they, what they don't have is discipline. It's as simple as that. It's, it's not a matter of control. It's a lack of discipline. I found all these things that I did, James, if you look at everything that I talked about, about running to work furlough, walking New York, changing all my people, places, things, that's discipline. And so I knew everything that I wanted was not going to be tomorrow. 
But I said, if I can just have the discipline to change my habit and rewire things, the things I want might happen. They may not happen. It, it's like, James, let's talk about this book for one second. Daily Sober. A year ago, I wrote that. I wrote 3,000 words a day, every day until I was done. It was hard. And my wife was like, wow, he's, he, every, day he, every, every day he does it. Because I knew I wanted to write the book. So it's not a lack of control. It's a lack of discipline. And I feel for me that if I had the discipline to go run around the city and waste all my money and try to get laid, then I should also have the discipline to put, it, to put forth towards a better life for myself. I, I deserve that. Why is it that someone like you was able to harness that discipline, to create that discipline, to execute on that discipline, and somebody else is un seemingly unable or chooses not to? You know, that is a great question. And like, I, I help people in sobriety. And um, a lot of times I try to tell people about discipline and you see that I don't know if they just don't don't they don't want it for themselves if they don't have the ability to focus. Uh, a lot of times I feel it's the lack of focus is that so many things go on in their head they can't focus on the one thing that they want whereas for me when I got sober I said I'm not drinking that's the thing I'm focusing on and I, everything else has got to go away whereas a lot of these people it's 17 other things going on and they they can't focus on the one thing they need to be disciplined about. Therefore, they lose control. They lose control. Yeah. Yeah. I've done a lot of study on how people can harness the impact of a like-minded community of people to keep them focused. So a lot of folks still, in my view, mistakenly believe that they can stop drinking alcohol or drugs or any kind of addiction on their own. Now, it seems like you were able to do it somewhat on your, on your own. Um, but I'm wondering whether you feel like t attempting to overcome an addiction like alcohol, for example, it's far more effective in a group of like-minded people with the same goal or whether you feel like it's just an individual switch that you can just choose and you don't need the accountability of a group. No, you definitely need a support system. You know, uh, like I know you have, you, you mentioned you have some of your programs, which I think I would, I would, I would heavily embrace. I did it on my, the decision I made was mine, James, but I went to AA. I did smart recovery. I, I hung out with new people that were sober. I, I built a support system. Could I have done it on my own? Yes, because I was that determined. Would it have been enjoyable? No. Would it have been harder? Yes. So it's way, like, I, I would never encourage anyone to try to do it alone. I would say, find whatever works for you, whatever type of support system. Now we have online stuff. You know, you have what you're doing. I have what I'm doing. There, there are things that people can connect with, but I definitely wouldn't recommend people do it on their own. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> there was a, the American Training Association put out a study that showed that your chances of success in any endeavor increase by 95% if you do it in a group of like-minded people with the same common goal. Yeah, that's why I go to CrossFit. You know, I do other things where I get to work out. I mean, I have, the, I have motivation to go to the gym, but it's way more enjoyable when I see 12 other people who are pushing me along. It's the same yeah. thing. When I go to AA, when I went to AA, I would, I would, sometimes I wouldn't want to go, but then I'd go and somebody would pat you on the back. They're glad to see you. Somebody you know just got a coin. And next thing you know, it's like, man, I'm glad I'm fellowshipping with these other people. Yeah, got it. Grab your book again for us, uh, Daily Sober. I want you to just flick through it, and then I'm going to tell you stop, and you're going to stop, and you're going to read from that page. So just flick through it. Here we go. Flick through it. Flick, let me, flick let me... through it. Here we go. One, two, three. Stop. Okay, now read, read from that page. Read, read, you read what you wrote in your book, The Daily Sober, on that page. Go for it. September 14th, be careful of environments, okay? Our environment plays a massive role in shaping our decisions. If you're on a diet but hang out in a candy store, you're probably going to eat some candy. For someone battling addiction, places like bars or clubs act as a consistent temptation. It's not just about willpower. It's about reducing the risk of relapsing by avoiding triggers. And here's a little bit about me. Around three weeks sober, I experienced a tempting situation. While having dinner with friends, someone I didn't know joined us and ordered a whiskey, my favorite brand. The aroma of the drink, the appearance, 
and the entire vibe was enticing. I politely excused myself. I texted my friend saying I'm putting my sobriety first. I left. They understood and encouraged me to join them when things would be more comfortable. You may keep reading? Yes, please. Okay. In that scenario, a couple things happened. I didn't fall prey to my temptation. I put my sobriety first. And two, my friends were supportive and encouraging of what I wanted to do. There was no peer pressure, which made it easy. When a sober person visits unhealthy environments, they're constantly exposed to what they're trying to avoid. This can reignite cravings and old habits, making, making staying on the right path harder. Testing your resolve can be exhausting and frankly dangerous. Frequenting these places can also lead to a sense of isolation or disconnection from the sober lifestyle. It might feel like being stuck between two worlds, not fully belonging to either. This can impact mental health and undermine the support system that's crucial for our recovery. Are you strong enough to leave situations that jeopardize your principles? And that's a question. And so that is September 14th. Be careful of environments. The next day is September 15th, and that's a spotlight on Brett Favre, who's sober. Yeah, the former NFL quarterback, yeah. Yeah, so, so, you know, James, what I tried to do is I tried to write a book, but it was very hard because I said nobody wants to read a whole book, but maybe they can read one page a day, and maybe that one page can be a nice little nugget that they can say, you know what? And, 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 And the thing is, James, I do videos, so if... Nobody wants to buy the book. Go to my Instagram and watch them for free every day, every day for free. And sometimes I will read something when I'm about to do a video. And guess who needed it? Me. Yeah. I, I, sometimes I, 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 re, I, I read what I wrote and I've said, I'm glad that I read that today. Yes. As I'm doing the video, you know. So anyhow, Daily Sober is 365 daily lessons. Every day is different. Yeah. Amazing. Well, I acknowledge you for writing that book and putting it out into the world, Justin. I I, I salute you, sir. Well played. And, Just trying to uh, help a little bit, you know. Yeah, yeah. And uh, where can our listener and viewer find you when you're talking about uh, sober content? And where can they go and have a look at your family doing all the, the things that your family are doing now with the 2 billion views and millions of followers? <laughs> yeah, we have like 5 million on Facebook, 5 million on uh YouTube, blah, blah, blah. It's a business, but we make family content. It's the Mighty McClure's, M-I-G-A. So my last name is McClure, M-I-G-A, M-I-G-H-T-Y, Mighty McClure's is our, is our kind of pseudonym. Um, you can find me on Instagram, Justin McClure. You could also find Daily Sober if you want to connect with the videos. Well, Justin McClure, thank you so much for sharing your story and your guidance and expertise with us today. We really appreciate it, and uh, I salute your success, your sobriety, and long may it continue, sir. Well, thank you so much for having me, and thank you for uh, thank you for what you're doing.